There we go. Um, yeah, so there really are no restrictions as to what you can make with Grignard reaction. So it's really, really powerful. But the downside is, is it doesn't typically get great yields because you have to make the Grignard reagents. And that's not a super um, efficient process as far as your yields. And then you need to take your Grignard reagents, purify them somehow, um, and then find a way and then use them again in another reaction that has lots of side reactions and byproducts and things like that. So um, it's sort of like, it's a little bit of the brute force approach because you can always make what you need to make with Grignard reagent. But sometimes if you can find a way to use reactions that have higher yields, it might be more efficient to go another route. Um, but as you're first getting started, when you're, when you're doing synthesis problems for this class, um, if you, you know, that should be like your default. If you need to add carbons, think green yard first and then see if there's maybe a way you could simplify it. Um, it's almost always the best way to add the most, the way to add carbons in the fewest steps. Um, and then I think the, the other question that I was, that I can remember was um, when we're reducing things with lithium aluminum hydride or um, sodium borohydride, do we need to worry about excess because there's several times we'll see excess, um, hey Rob, um, we'll see excess sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride to make sure it goes through multiple reductions. Um, and really, and the, the question, I think it was Lex's question, um, they asked, um, do we need to worry about having that excess before we go in and add the water? And the it's a really good question, but actually the adding the water for the second step for the proton transfer is twofold. It has two purposes, one of which is to use up the excess. Because when you put some a really strong reducing agent with water, it reduces the hydrogen in the water and you get hydrogen gas, but it uses up the excess um, reagents that way. So it's a pretty good um, it's a pretty good way to both use up the excess lithium aluminum hydride and um, the, uh, get the proton transfer step to happen. Um, so I, I didn't hit close on my PowerPoint on my other laptop, so it didn't, it didn't upload to Dropbox. So it says TBD, but, um, and this is now, I believe your questions from a few weeks ago at this point, um, because we had such weird schedules. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, just to, to briefly recap the, Question, Rob, your questions about the green yard reactions. Um, they're basically, we can make anything we want with green yard reactions, which makes them really powerful, but the low yields means that we don't, we uh, sometimes it can be advantageous to do like the acetylide um, addition reaction if there's a convenient way to do it, if it's an easy step. But the, the green yard reaction is more like the brute force approach. We can always make what we need to with the green yard reaction, it just might not be great yields. Use. Yeah, you wind up with um, with re reactions where equilibrium favors the product more and have fewer side reactions as opposed to the green yard reagent where every molecule of water mixed in there is going to drop your yield and there's always water around, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, lots of other things. Anytime you, the green yard reagents are really, really strong bases as well as being good nucleophiles. And so if there's any proton source around at all, you wind up with that causing a drop in yield as well. Um, yeah, that, there, that's the one. All right, um, and I hope everybody was was uh, had a I won't say restful, but um, had a good weekend, a memorable weekend. That was that was might be the biggest storm I've seen in like ten years. Yeah, it just yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> I don't remember. I mean, obviously, we've had years where we had more snow than, than this year, but I don't remember it ever going from zero to 60 like this yeah. um, in one storm. Right. Yeah. I definitely underestimated it. I didn't think anything was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> like the past storms? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Friday being underreported, but yeah. nobody was ready for Saturday. <laughs> um, but all right, so then, but last week, so last week we only had the one lecture, so we didn't have the quiz, and then I forgot to send out uh, an assignment over the weekend. 
because I didn't have power most of the weekend and um, everybody had other stuff to do anyway. So uh, consider that a, a break um, and we'll get back to it this week. Uh, it is week. It's also now week nine. We only have this week and two more and then finals, um, which just seems like this quarter really flew by as with all the weird schedule and me getting sick and everything else. So we're going to get through. The nice thing is, though, we still have one more quarter of the series. So we'll get through what we get through before finals. And if it's a little bit less than it was last year, then that's no big deal because we'll just pick it up in, in the spring quarter. Um, so just to recap, since it's been a week, uh, we talked about oxidations mostly. Um, so green, green yard reactions and lithium aluminum hydrides um, are, and hydride sources in general are gonna give us reductions. Um, oxidations of alcohols are what going to be what produces our carbonyls instead of the other way around. Instead of taking carbonyls and reducing them to get alcohols, take alcohols and oxidize them to get carbonyls. Um, and this is just a term that, that um, I didn't really define all that well uh, before. Um, let me pull up the functional group uh, figure real quick. Um, kind of, I know I've mentioned the carboxylic acid derivatives. The other term I want you to be aware of that shows up for um, with, with carbonyls is class one carbonyls versus class two carbonyls. And there. Um, so, but basically the aldehydes and um, ketones, despite the fact they're not the identical oxidation state, they're similar oxidation states. Um, because if it's ketone, it's carbon to two other carbons, which in then to two, um, two carbon oxygen bonds, which gives ketones an oxidation state of um, the carbon in the middle as an oxidation state of plus two, right? Aldehyde is not quite the same because the carbon to the hydrogen is a plus, is a minus one for the carbon and the carbon to oxygen is plus two. And then carbon to carbon is neutral. So aldehydes are plus one oxidation state rather than plus two. So they're not identical as far as that, that is concerned. However, they're, they react similarly enough um, and really that's why they have to consider two different functional groups. You know, we've, we've always sort of arbitrarily separated them in, as being ketones and aldehydes are not the same. Um, and the reason that they're not the same is because they have different oxidation states on that carbon, even though they react similarly. on the touch screen. All right, so you look at that middle row, those are all um, acid, or those are all carbonyl groups. And those first two, the aldehydes and ketones are considered, those are our, I'm gonna mix this up. I believe, I'm second guessing. I wanna say those are class one. And class two is basically all the rest of them. All of the acid derivatives um, are going to have those carbons are going to have the same oxidation state. And for each of them, it's going to be a plus three. Um, and so a plus three oxidation state is always going to give you um, a class two carbonyl. And these all have similar reactive patterns. And so the other thing that's that's worth noting about these is that the um, the 
acid derivatives, they're all referred to as one kind of class because it's pretty easy to convert back and forth between them. You can go from an acid to an ester to an amide back to an acid anhydride pretty readily. There's no really tough reactions in there. It's a one-step reaction pretty much across the board to go back and forth between any of these. So that's why they kind of get grouped together. They have similar, they're the same oxidation state. They have similar reactivities. You can convert back and forth between them pretty well. Um, as opposed to going from a ketone to a carboxylic acid or an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, that is an oxidation reaction now. That's going to take different reactants. And that's a that's a harder reaction to reverse. And it's a harder reaction. Um, you're going to have to use more specific reduce our oxidizing agents to go back and forth between there. And so and that's also why we make the distinction in the um, in these reactions for there are reactions that can take you from a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid versus primary alcohol to an aldehyde. Um, we make a pretty big delineation there because those are two different levels of oxidation and they behave very differently as a result. Not to mention that, and we have, that's that's just looking at the chemical properties. If you want to take into account, account that um, biological properties of acids versus aldehydes are significantly different as well. Um, although in terms of being able to um to fool fool your your enzymes and and pathways inside your body and act as medication there are still some some similarities you know cinnamaldehyde is a molecule that tastes like cinnamon it's the flavor of big red basically um cin uh cinna cinnoic acid is the oxidized form of that and behaves very, very similar and tastes and smells pretty similar too. It just has a higher melting point, frankly, and different solubility. So there are going to be some similarities, but the biological aspect always gets things confused, right? Because as long as yeah. most of the molecule looks similar, it's probably going to have some pretty similar properties in terms of taste and smell. Uh, but as soon as you start bringing in things like um, well, if it's the aldehyde is the part of the molecule that interacts with a specific enzyme, then changing it from an aldehyde to an acid could have big biochemical effects. Enzymes just, it's a, because every pathway is unique, every active site is unique, it's a whole different category, um, which is why we have to learn OCHEM before we can really get into biochem, because you need to be able to talk about these functional groups and their properties and pretty pretty well before you can really get into. And here's how it affects the, this binding site um, because all of that's going to be a lot more specific to different pathways. Um, as much as I loved biochemistry, I, I did. I loved my biochemistry class so much that despite the, the professor being writing really bad tests, I voluntarily took molecular bio with the same professor that was a 7.30 a.m. lecture um, as an elective. I didn't even need to do that. Um, so I really liked biochem, but it always was more bio than chem because there's so much sort of memorization. There's like classes, but a lot of it is like you memorize the Krebs cycle and what the pathway is and what the enzymes are and what their names are and things like that. It always felt more like biology than chemistry to me, but that doesn't, that's kind of an aside. Um, all right. So, and these were our, our primary oxidation reactions. The other thing we talked about was substitution and elimination of alcohols, right? Um, and the main category we were talking about there was um, that we pretty much always need to make the oxygen a better leaving group in order to make to, to have it go through an SN1 or SN2 with any sort of um, decent yield. Um, but we did give ourselves a couple of good pathways where we can replace an OH group with um, a bromide, which then we could do whatever we wanted with that. 
and we can go the opposite route, we could take a bromide and replace it with an OH group. Um, so we had a lot of we have a lot of tools now. So what's the next thing we do? Well, once we get the handle on alcohols, we add another functional group. So today we're going to talk about about ethers in particular because ethers and alcohols have a lot of similarities. Um, specifically, the the big difference is is that you don't have an OH group; you have an oxygen and then another R group. So you can think of ethers as linking two different carbon skeletons together. But typically the way we think about these is that you've got your primary molecule and then the ether is sort of a branch to your primary molecule. So we're gonna, that's how the naming system works is it's just like adding a methyl group to a parent molecule or adding a chlorine to a parent molecule. You name the parent molecule and then you name the branch for the substituent, um, ethers are behave a lot like that. So it's just, and it's typically the primary part of the molecule. Um, the parent molecule is the bigger or at least more complicated side of the ether chain. Um, you kind of have to establish which side is the primary side. And if it's a symmetric ether, like um, diethyl ether, that's the ether that's anesthetic one that we've talked about before. Um, diethyl ether, you kind of, that's not the IUPAC name for it, but a lot of times the, the old school way of naming things is you just name, it's an ether, you say the word ether, and then you name each of the sides like it's, they're both a branch. So you can have methyl ethyl ether or dimethyl ether or dipropyl, diisopropyl ether. Um, but we'll get to the IUPAC name in a second. Um, while we're looking at this slide, this is just some some common ether molecules or just that are highlighting among lots of different functional groups um, that the ethers are also present. Um, it says you can tell this is sort of an older figure because I believe that that. Um, the role of melatonin in the circadian rhythm, as far as as the you know um, most mammals that have a a night day cycle, um, I believe that the biologists who worked on this got a Nobel Prize in medicine for their work on showing how melatonin is related to um, to sleep cycles in. Um, I'm trying to think what the opposite of nocturnal is, but mammals that are awake during the day. Um, so nocturnal, maybe diurnal. Diurnal might just be that it has was. So I do know. So the the vocab word that sticks out to me because it's such a weird word is uh, corpusculent. <laughs> corpusculent means that they're most active at dusk and dawn. Oh. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know about what they, maybe that's just the default, but either way, uh, animals that are awake during the day, melatonin serves a really important role um, and basically sort of um, causing a signal cascade that starts the sleep process. Um, it typically peaks around 9 p.m. in humans. Um, and but melatonin is broken down by processes that are stimulated by blue light. So blue light in particular um, causes basically the breakdown of melatonin, which is why looking at your screens late at night really messes with your sleep cycle so much is because it, it lowers artificially your melatonin level. So your body doesn't feel as tired as it actually is. Your brain doesn't, isn't ready for bed. Um, and, and that's why you can wind up with that. You know, why typically after about nine o'clock at night, you should really switch to um, reading something, or at least if you're gonna be on a device, something that has like a, a nighttime mode that removes a lot of that blue light will limit some of the damage there. Um, it also, and this is not supported by science, but this is just me making a stretch. Um, I find that, that uh, when I wake up first thing in the morning, instead of hitting the snooze button and going back to sleep, if I turn on my phone and I read some headlines, 
um, stay off of social media first thing in the morning, but like do a little bit of, of reading on my on my tablet or my phone first thing in the morning. I actually, it actually does help me shake the cobwebs better than going back to sleep for five minutes, but that might just be me. Um, I like to attribute it to that blue light breaks down melatonin, um, but I don't know that that's actually true. Um, I feel like that's probably true because I feel like when you go to bed, your body's like, okay, I'm going to restart another sleep cycle. Yeah. And then you just abruptly yeah, like, snooze, wake up again. Tired, yeah. well, and that's why I think waking up with the natural light, like blackout curtains are really hard to right. like, yeah, it's nice to be able to sleep in, but when you need to be up, like going straight from blackout curtains to full light is really, really hard on your, on your brain, at least mine. Yeah, I've heard that you like wake up and you're groggy to like go immediately go outside with like out sunglasses and just be out like natural light for a few minutes and it, it helps your body like wake That's up. Okay. Well, well, your option then school. Yeah. <laughs> you first wake up, but I've also seen too like some people that are like I, I saw it on I don't know whose page it was, but he was like a CrossFit guy and so we'd wake up at like four a.m. to train. But he had an alarm clock that had like a natural like sundial in it, so it builds yeah. yeah it made the light the room like lighter. Or he would have to wake up. There's probably a lot to that. To some, to some yeah. extent, at least. All right, but back to ethers. Um, like I mentioned before, if we're naming using the common names, although these these are not as common of a name in this as we've seen, a lot of times the common names are um, these systems are a lot less universal, um, like the isopropyl versus the methyl ethyl. Um, the common names for ethers are really simple to come up with, uh, but they only work for pretty small molecules. Um, so methyl ethyl ether, T butyl methyl ether, um, dimethyl ether, diethyl ether, et cetera. Um, so you will still see these, uh, especially in, in hardware stores. As in, in most things, if you if you have to buy chemicals from vendors that are not used to providing chemicals to chemists, a lot of times they have the old school names. Um, the other one that comes to mind is um, if you do any painting or work in, in, in um, do contractor work where you have to do any painting, um, methyl ethyl ketone gets used all the time, which has a different IUPAC name entirely, but you still see MEK, as it's called, um, all the time, mostly in hardware stores, because when you don't know the actual chemistry, it's easier to just learn what it's called from whoever's teaching you, and that perpetuates the old school way of naming things, right? Um, the IUPAC way of naming these is to name the whole ether as a branch, um, except instead of just saying it's an ethyl group or an ethyl ether group, we just say, use the same prefix that we would use before to indicate how big it is. And then you, instead of adding the YL, you turn it into, um, you add oxy to the end. So an ethyl ether is an ethoxy group. A methyl ether is a methoxy group. You can have a um, propoxy group. And then, and then you can use the parentheses within this as well. You can have a methyl, like for instance, a, an isopropyl ether. So let's say we had, I don't know, make it cyclo, whoa. You seeing that show up twice and then change positions too? Okay. I can't pay attention to what I'm drawing and also look over there at the same time, so I wasn't sure. Um, if you have an isopropyl ether like this, parent name would be cyclohexane, and then it's going to be an ethoxy group that has a methyl on the ethoxy group. So this is why learning those parentheses wound up being really powerful, right? Because we can just put parentheses and say, okay, it's methyl ethoxy. cyclohexane. 
right? So really the only difference is the fact that it's, we're naming it like it's a regular branch, just throwing that oxy term in there to indicate that there's an oxygen and then the rest of the branch. Um, that said, a lot of, a lot of ethers in biological applications, just like with all of these functional groups, are going to have their own, their own names. So once you get to these larger molecules that have multiple functional groups, odds are you're not going to be using IUPAC names, although we will still modify existing names by using these prefixes. So you can have things like um, methoxy melatonin. If there was an extra methoxy group attached, you could have methoxy melatonin. And so we still use these, these prefixes to amend existing molecules. Um, trying to think of some other good examples. There's lots of medications that take existing biological molecules and add, add a function, add a chlorine here or add an alcohol there um, to, to make it a different molecule. All right, so let's let's practice these. See yeah. um so the morphine molecule, it was like a a, a cyclic, like a, a ring. So does yeah. that ability through that? If it's it's really still an ether. It's just going to be a different subclass of ethers. Um I'm and I'm blanking now. Um there's this I keep thinking crown ethers, but that's a different class. Um We'll get to what the name for that is. If not today, then in the next next lecture. Is it epoxy still an ether? Or is that a different class? Is what? Is an epoxy like a sub set of ethers or yes? So that's an epoxy specifically is a cyclic ether that only has three sides to the ring. Um, if it's a four-sided ring where oxygen is one of them, it's not an epoxy, an epoxide group. Um, the other one that you see all the time that you may not have realized was an ether is glucose. All of the carbohydrates when they're in their ring form. I'm actually just making up the stereochemistry here. I don't remember specifically what the stereochemistry is for um, glucose, which ones are up and which ones are down. But the point there is that when they're in their ring form, you've got an ether as part of those as well. So carbohydrates are really just a sub this very specific subclass um, of ethers that fit very certain both chemical and biological requirements. It's not really a carbohydrate if it can't if you can't digest it um, or if it's not if it's not based around certain um, certain parameters like you have to have the ratio of approximately two oxygen or one oxygen for every carbon and two hydrogens for every carbon. So all pretty much all carbohydrates have the same CN H N H two N O N form. So for glucose that's C six H twelve O six. Um and fructose is the same formula, but ribose is C5H10O5. So you get some similarities there, but those are definitely, when they're in their ring form, especially um, like the ribose in D and DNA is, um, is definitely a, still an ether. All right, so what is this first one gonna be? Cyclohexane? Methoxy, methoxy's right. It's it's not cyclohexane though. Aromatic, which may in the simplest aromatic molecule that we deal with all the time is phenol. Benzene. Thank you. So it's not phenol because okay. phenol it's a phenyl group with with the YL. Um, so if we're using the old school way of naming this, this would be methyl phenyl ether. Um, the new school way of naming things, we would just say benzene is the parent molecule, so we would just name it methoxybenzene. Although this does have its own common name, and I'm a little hazy on, on the 
common names for this monosubstituted benzene. So I believe that's anisole is the common name for that. Better name though is methoxybenzene. Nobody can misinterpret. If you write methoxybenzene. And for the second one, what's our parent molecule for B? It's our biggest carbon group. So just cyclopentane, yeah. And then everything else is just named as a as a branch. So three. Three, three, dichloro. I didn't quite leave myself enough room, but one ethoxy. Cyclopentane. Stereochemistry on that one. We don't have to worry about cis and trans, right? Because we have two chlorines on the same carbon. So it doesn't matter whether the ethoxy group is up or down, it's still going to be cis to one chlorine and trans to the other chlorine. But we do still have to think about R versus S. Luckily, it's already in a position that makes that pretty easy. What's our highest priority substituent attached to the to the ether carbon? The ether is the highest priority, yeah. And then lowest is the hydrogen that's already into the board. So then you've got two and three. So R. R three three dichloro one ethoxy cyclopentane. Rolls right off the top. My wife has started getting flavored coffees. And well, I won't make myself the flavored coffee. I always make her coffee first in the morning, which means everything just very faintly smells and tastes like hazelnut now. <laughs> All right. So here's the one that I kept. When you ask me about the cyclic ethers, this is the one that kept getting stuck in my head because this is a very specific type of um, cyclic ether. Uh, this, these are known as crown ethers, and they call them that. The and the reason this is bears its own special mention here is because while cyclic ethers show up all over the place, crown ethers have very specific um, uses. Uh, because if you if you build them right, if they're structured right, you wind up with these cyclic molecules where you wind up with a whole bunch of electron density in this ring in the middle, which is kind of similar to a benzene ring in that that you wind up with with that um, partial strong electron density in the same part, except that we can change the size of these. We change the size of these we can actually build them to fit around specific other molecules or ions. Um, so these actually have a lot of, a lot of potential in applications like treating um, heavy metal poisoning, because effectively what you can do is by using say 15 crown five, um, if that's the right radius of ring to fit around say a lead atom, a lead ion, it's going to bond really strongly with that lead ion because the lead's got a plus a positive charge, either plus two or plus four. Um, and so you can basically surround it with this molecule that keeps it from interacting as strongly with um, enzymes. So 
You have to be careful with it though, because this is also the same basic structure that holds the iron in place in hemoglobin as well. Right, a hemoglobin group is very similar to this, except it's, it's, let me just pull up structure so we can see the similarities. These are synthetic. They, um, when noticing how heme groups worked in hemoglobin and myoglobin, um, it was basically was, was thought, okay, well, we can make a molecule that's similar to that. So the heme group in hemoglobin is this flat structure that has all these nitrogen lone pairs pointed towards the middle to the empty space that kind of holds an iron ion in place, um, which in terms of the uh, um, 3D structures looks something like this. So you can see how that is pretty similar to the structure. So basically, um, the chemists and biochemists basically said, well, we can make a molecule that's simpler than, heme, than a heme group. Heme group specifically is this ring with a uh, with an iron attached to it. Um, however, if you don't have the iron attached, just that flat molecule with the rings all attached to each other, so it's rings within rings, um, is known as a porphyrin ring. Um, but it's it's a similar one of the one of the main ways that that heavy metal poisoning occurs is heavy metal ions. And by that I mean anything basically from the fourth row down can wind up displacing metal ions that are supposed to be in your body from groups like this that hold them in place. So if we can make a, a better molecule that can bind to these heavy metal ions better than say a heme group then that can allow us to then remove them from the body with treatment over time to sort of reverse the effects of heavy metal poisoning faster. In theory, most heavy metal poisoning, if you remove the toxin, most heavy metal poisoning occurs over really long periods of time. And if you remove the toxin, the body eventually will get rid of it. Um, however, if you want to speed that process up so that you're not suffering from lead poisoning for, um, you know, 20 years while you your body finally gets rid of it, you can do it with with therapies that basically go through and bind to those lead ions better than the enzyme than the lead ions bind to the enzymes. And one of the ways that you do that is by using crown ethers. Um they're they're looking at it for a lot of places. So the the current standard treatment is still chelation. So this is a form of what's called chelation therapy. When you make that metal ion organic complex, that's called a chelate. Um, and so you still see that. In fact, if you, they, I think there's even a, you can do that like over the counter. You can go, there's a place in Reno that does chelation therapy uh, where they basically will just treat you with a molecule called EDTA, uh, which is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Um, what's that? It's a complex ion. It's a complex ion. You make it complex where you basically surround metal ions with that. If you do that too often, you wind up do you do wind up pulling out the metal ions that are supposed to be there as well. So it's good for removing toxins, but long term it'll also remove the stuff that you want to stay there. So like with most things, poisons in the dose. Um, but so I don't. The other place of looking at these is with drug delivery. Um, because if you can get it to hold on to a, a specific ion, for instance, like platinum ions are toxic, um, but they're also used in treating cancer because the whole idea with most cancer treatments is to kill the tumor, right? But that turns out that kills a lot of other cells as well. And so if you can, if you can direct where the toxin is delivered in a very specific way, then you limit the side effects of chemotherapy and, and, radiation therapy and things like that. Um, so they are using it in some places. Uh, I don't know the specifics. I think cisplatin is the one that I can think of that I believe is a platinum ion that's in a, I think it's a crown ether.
So that one's not as strongly chelate. That's not a crown ether. They're looking at doing crown ether, but this is a chemotherapy treatment drug. Um, basically, the, the amine groups will basically fall off after a certain period of time in the body, and you wind up with the platinum binding to cells. And so you want to try and keep that limited to just the, um, the parts of the body that you're trying to kill. Uh, interesting, what do we talk about about how um, thalidomide? I know I, thalidomide is always the example we use when we first talk about R versus S. That's the, that drug that was used as morning um, sickness treatment um, because it causes horrendous uh, side effects and tissue de death in cells that are currently dividing, um, which now it's being used as a cancer treatment because it is effective. If you're not pregnant, that is a good way of stopping cells from dividing that you don't want to divide. Um, so there are a lot of things going on with cancer treatments. Um, but as far as I'm aware, they're most, most of them are still, they're not really doing anything that experimental still at this point. Um, I should add, well, I was going to say, I should ask my friend who's, whose wife is going through chemo right now, but I probably should wait on that and not ask right now. Um, it's, she's a very good friend of ours and it's less than ideal situation. They just had their fourth kid. Um, and then she had a golf ball sized tumor taken out of her brain two months later. Um, so, but they're both, they're both engineers. My, it's, it's my buddy from grad school who, who did work on um, computational chemistry research. So I am no, I know he's paying attention to what chemicals it is, but I'll wait to ask till a more opportune, appropriate time. Um, the effects of this, of these crown ethers on, in terms of smaller things, we'll stick away from, stay away from the biological side of things because that's too complicated, is basically you can increase solubility a lot because basically you wind up surrounding this is a molecule that will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent pretty well. Ionic compounds, however, won't. But if you can surround one piece of your ionic compound with all of this electrostatic potential, you can wind up with it sort of um, insulating it from the, from the benzene as the solvent, and that increases your solubil solubility there, which then allows you to do things like use fluoride as a nucleophile in nonpolar solvents um, and allow you to, to do that. Um, we're not going to spend a ton of time on that because a lot of this is still very, it's very, very niche. Um, it doesn't get used all over the place, but just be aware of what the concept of a crown ether is. Well, I'm not going to test you on the nomenclature for these. Um, but we can kind of Put together it's a pretty simple system once you think about it 18 crown six 18 is back for a second so the 12 or 15 or the 18 is lit is the total number of atoms in the ring structure then how many of them are oxygens is that second number so 12 crown four, 12 sided structure, um, four of them are oxygens. All right. So what let's let's go ahead and take our break there. And we'll uh, let's come back at 11 and we'll get into some of the reactions.
make sure labs all set up for us later real quick because Mario hasn't put everything away. She's back. Yeah, I'm worried. She's too story. efficient. Yeah. <laughs> Such a show like uh like watching on this game. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And like driving it through the storm was fine. Once yeah. the storm was over and everybody came out, it was like a nightmare. <laughs> like, like, trucks were all stuck, and like it took us like an hour to get like across town. Yeah, it's faster just to walk at that yeah. point. Other than dude walking his dog, and I was like over by Applebee's, and then I saw him like kind of pass me, and then he was going up, and then I didn't pass him again until like past like El Dorado Beach, like two miles down the road. <laughs> Uh, not with not me, with but from, I had to like dip from. out early last Wednesday. It's like for for Telly's, the pressures, yeah, going like up and down. No worries, I'll go. Yeah. Had, had to like run out early on Wednesday, and then I was like. I, I do have because I remember okay I know what day you're talking about because I'm just trying to think of like what day because I did miss like some physics but that was two weeks ago but yeah, I sure. when we were all working on that equation I was like where did Rob go and they're yep. like Rob just couldn't open yep. it I was, like, I was like where did he go so I do have the I think we just finished that really question. yeah no that was literally it. for the rest of the hour I think so I think like we just talked about it so much yeah more I'll, I'll, I'll send you though when I get no worries I'll just check with you tomorrow yeah Class, yeah. But yeah, I'm doing the same thing tomorrow yeah. too. I was gonna ask Taylor for all these like different things that I missed. Yeah, I got some other stuff <laughs> before that if you need to. I, was trying, I, I went through like I started reading the book from like the beginning of where this test starts. And yeah, I'm feeling all good, and then I got up to like the end of the Bertelli shit. I'm like, oh, that's weird. The book doesn't really explain it very well. Side note, look up when you walk out that door. Um, it's shedding snow off the roof right on the walkway, and it's really heavy looking right now. Nobody get hurt. Yeah, it's like Anybody do anything weekend. fun that wasn't snow related this weekend? Do <laughs> <Dude>, my house. <laughs> Everything is snow related this weekend. <laughs> I Sons, my eldest son is finally to the age now where he can appreciate things. Yeah, I too. We call them the elders because we have really two groups. We have a ten and an eight year old, and then an almost two year old. Um, the ten and the eight year old got to watch their first R rated movie last weekend. We watched Zombie Land. Uh, my son has been going through like, well, what if the zombies came? What would we do? <laughs> He's not like we should watch. Because they're like, well, you gotta, you gotta think about your cardio and say like, what. <laughs> so we had to watch zombies. Uh huh. Yeah, they, they did pretty well with it. And then, so then last night I took him to Dune, my my son, because he got really into the first movie. It's one of my favorite books of all time. So, and we didn't get to see the first one in theaters, which I still regret. Yeah. No, the the old you know the fact that yesterday was a snow day was actually really helpful that way because like you know what got got the driveway clear it's not snowing anymore yeah. and you go to a movie get out of the house a little bit so that was fun. 
No, it's the, it's the rest of the first book. Oh, okay. Although Dennis, I don't speak French, so I don't want to butcher his last name. Villeneuve for whatever um, is is said he wants to go up until um, what is it? God Emperor of Dune is the last one before Chapter House Dune. Um, and maybe I think it's like with Children of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and God Emperor of Dune, maybe. I read I read like up to the sixth book at some point, but I know the first book like word for word. Um, but yeah, he said he wants to go up until like this third or fourth book. So that would be really cool because I really like his directing style and, and everything. It's the same guy he did um Arrival. Uh, our arrival's really good. Yeah. It's really trippy. Yeah. Um and it's uh, Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner are the, the two leads. But it's all about how language language and the language you think in affects your perception of the world around you. Um, she's a linguist that they bring in to try and start to communicate with these aliens. It's, it's really good. Um, I think it's on Netflix right now. You know, highbrow, pretentious, Sci-fi is sort of my jam, so um, he's he's right up my alley. See the one you were talking about, twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. Yeah. Is the ninety six one any good? I don't know that that's related. That I I don't even know if it's the same story. That rival is just not that uncommon. Oh, right. Right. Well, uh -huh. Although if you're into Dune, the original, not the original, but the um, they was it Lynch, David Lynch who did the the one, um, the last cinematic release of of a Dune movie. And so you do it attracts really weird, pretentious directors to you. That's probably why I like it so much. Kyle, Kyle, what's his name? Kyle Laughlin, the, the cop from Twin Peaks, um, was was Paul Atreides in the one from the late 80s, early 90s. That one was really weird and trippy too. Six arrival. I can't. I mean, Charlie Sheen did some out there stuff. Yeah, there's the arrival. Jarvel and Amy Blake in the one twenty sixteen. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Is is it? Does it look like it's the same? It's not the same director. It, it, it looks like. Well, yeah, it looks like it's the same um, plot. There's like okay. they discovered intelligent alien life, but they're not. Oh. Like now I need to go watch the Charlie other. Sheen one to see how okay. similar it is. But no, I was thinking of the 2016 one was was really good. And Dennis Villeneuve, though. Villeneuve. Any of you speak French? And he's from Quebec, so who knows how it's actually pronounced that speaking French would necessarily help because Quebecois is so different than French French. Oh, that's right. I'd forgotten that the Blade Runner reboot or sequel was him, too. Like I said, highbrow, pretentious sci-fi is sort of his gym.
All right. Well, we'll put aside sci-fi movies for now. I can't believe I'm saying that. All right, so if we're trying to make ethers, there's a few ways we can go about it. Um, the, so the simplest way to do it is just an SN2 where you replace, if you take an, an alcohol and put it through an SN2 reaction to replace the um, OH group with an ether group instead, um, this has limitations though. And, and it really is, it's pretty simple. First step is you pro, it has to be acid catalyzed because the first step is you protonate your alcohol to make it a better leaving group. And then if you have a deprotonated alcohol around the oxygen from the second alcohol can act as the nucleophile and the, you leave uh, the water molecule can then leave. And then it's just a proton transfer step to remove the extra proton. Um, why, why would these limitations make sense? Why would it only work for primary alcohols and only produce symmetrical ethers? Take one at a time. Why does this only work for a primary alcohol? Yeah, SN2 reactions slow down the more subs the more substituents you have around the target, right? So we can still see an SN2 reaction slowly for a primary or for a secondary leaving group, but a tertiary leaving group, you don't see any SN2 happening, right? Um, why would we? Why would it only produce a symmetrical ether? Seems like you'd be able to use any alcohol for that second step, right? But think about the logic of, of how you would do this in a lab. You took ethanol and you acid catalyzed and you, you made it acidic. The reason this only works makes symmetrical ethers is because you basically have to start with the pure alcohol. You need to have so much of the alcohol around that it can act as a nucleophile to drive the equilibrium forward. So basically, you have to start from the pure alcohol, which means when this happens, you get the SN2 re reaction is always going to be a solvent molecule attacking the same solvent molecule, just the protonated. Right, so you can do this as much as you want. However, the only time you're going to get good yields are if it's dissolved in itself, if it's the pure alcohol made acidic, and only for primary alcohols. You're going to get a bunch of different products, and the yields aren't going to be great because you diluted it. You lowered the concentration of everything by mixing two of them together, right? And you can't really isolate that first intermediate um, and like purify it and then add pure protonated alcohol to anything else. So what we typically see instead is called the Williamson ether synthesis. The Williamson ether synthesis once again, creatively named, um, really straightforward. Instead of being acid catalyzed, we do this under strong basic conditions. But you have to be careful with strong basic conditions that you don't wind up um, with competing side reactions, right? And so the way to avoid that is the basic conditions, the base that they use is just a hydride. You have a hydride around that hydride can basically steal the NH plus from an alcohol molecule and make it into the deprotonated form, right? And if you have a deprotonated form of molecule, that's a really strong nucleophile. 
And then, so then you just, step two is expose it to an alkyl halide. So it's still gonna be an SN2 process. We're just changing the order a little bit and we're making, making the alcohol itself um, the strong nucleophile. And the fact that we're doing this with, with hydride means that when we deprotonate the alcohol, we produce hydrogen gas, right? Which leaves the system, drives it towards equilibrium. And we get a salt that we can actually then purify and, and reuse. So depending on what the blue R is, we could wind up making something that's really pretty shelf stable make sodium ethoxide or sodium methoxide or sodium isopropoxide. Um, and then take that deprotonated alcohol and expose it to whatever alkyl halide we want as a way to make an ether very, very specifically um, and try to limit the number of side reactions. All right, so step two, or step one, deprotonate and make hydrogen. Step two is your deprotonated alcohol acts as a nucleophile. It's still SN2 though. So we're still limited by sterics. And sometimes that might affect what, what we consider the way we write this out. So for every ether, every ether has two sides to the ether, right? So we might need to pick which side is which step. What's our blue R group and versus what's our red R group based on the sterics. Because you can do step one on pretty much anything, right? You can deprotonate pretty much any alcohol you want and it can still act as a nucleophile. Even if it's a pretty big sterically hindered molecule, it can still be a decent nucleophile, even if it's not great. Um, but you need the target for the second step to be primary or secondary. Um, and it's still, you still will see sort of a range of rates, right? It's still not gonna be perfect um, if we wind up with, uh, if we are trying to make a, a T-butyl ether where, where both sides of the ether are tertiary, we're still not gonna be able to use this. This is pretty powerful and pretty universal but we still are going to have some issues with that. And it's still going to be really, really slow for some of these reactions, depending on what the sterics are like. Here's an example of how we could make so MTBE um, is methyl tert-butyl ether. It's a gasoline additive too. You've seen MTBE. Um, I believe it's it's a carcinogen. So I, in California, probably on the um, on the gas pump, it's got one of those stickers. There are chemicals in this facility known to the state of California to call, cause cancer. Um, MTBE, I believe, is called out specifically as one of those. It's it's, um, but it, it helps the gasoline burn a lot cleaner, so you get a lot less smoke and pollution um, from the gasoline. So that in like a gas station at Myers and then the guy like the alarm went off that it was leaking and he just ignored it and it became like a huge like lawsuit and the LA district got like millions of dollars from it. So that that would make a lot of sense, especially in Myers, because that's that's all in the upper Truckee basin, right? So it's all draining right into the lake. The lake yeah. yeah, it's it is one of those chemicals. It's really in common use, but it is pretty nasty as well. Um, so you do see it in in news headlines uh, relatively often. Um, but anyway, so if we're trying to make MTBE here, we do have to pick our order here because if we if we deprotonate methanol and then try to have it act on a tertiary iodide, that's not going to work because our target carbon has is tertiary. And so it can't go through an SN2 reaction because you've just got too much other stuff around. But on the other hand, if you deprotonate the a T-butyl alcohol, so this would be what dimethyl, dimethyl ethanol. Uh, if you if you make that your nucleophile and have it attack ethyl iodide, 
Now the target, yes, that's still a big bulky group on a base and big bulky bases. Can you can get some competing reactions because that'll favor elimination under a lot of circumstances, having this big bulky group. But you can still get a measurable amount there and you can tweak the conditions to further favor the substitution over the elimination by doing it at low temperatures, et cetera. Um, but it just means that just, just like with the Grignard reaction where there was, you know, five different ways you could combine these three R groups in, in whatever order you were talking about, um, with the Williamson ether synthesis, there's almost always two ways to do it. But a lot of times one of those ways is going to be better than, than the other, unless it's symmetrical. If you're making a symmetrical ether, then it doesn't really matter as much. So let's practice that. How would you make ethoxybenzene, Williamson ether synthesis? It is it. So option one, I kind of, I circled the original molecule in sort of a Venn diagram looking. First I had them separated with the red circle is just the benzene ring and the blue circle is just the ethyl group. But then I realized that one of them has to start with the oxygen, right? So really your choices are either you start with the with phenol, where you've got an oxygen attached to the benzene ring already, and then ethyl bromide or ethyl iodide is going to be your target. Or you can start with the ethanol. Do the deprotonation step and then follow it up with bromobenzene. Does one of these make more sense than the other? It would make it so. Is it a bigger deal to have the smaller target for SN2? or smaller nucleophile. You want the, well, you want the smaller target. You want the less sterically hindered target. 
So the top one is a better option. And then there's a second issue here, which is that we haven't really touched using, doing any SN2 reactions on aromatic groups, right? That's not, aromatic carbons are not good targets for SN2. So just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean that you can't do that, but we'll find out that benzene rings react a lot better to electrophilic substitution than nucleophilic substitution. Um, so in general, we want to avoid doing any sort of nucleophilic substitution on a benzene ring. We can turn phenol though into a nucleophile because that's actually just acting on the oxygen, not the benzene ring itself. In theory, the bottom one could potentially work, but because that aromaticity is just going to throw too many, too many wrenches in the, in the works. So, not that one. Phenol exposed to sodium hydride is going to make sodium monoxide. I believe would be the IUPAC way of saying that take phenol and you drop the L and you add oxide. Um, and then that deprotonated phenol, phenolate, that's a phenolate. Um, the phenolate could then act as the nucleophile and the ethanol is the target for the nucleophile. Let's do one more of those, we'll make one up here. Let's see, we wanted to make, we wanted to make an ether that looked like, notice that this is not a benzene ring now. We want cyclohexyl isopropoxyl isopropyl ether. Or methyl ethoxide cyclohexane using that Williamson ether synthesis. What are the two pathways we could go, we could use? And which one would you think is a better option? First off, what are the two alcohols we could start from? Cyclohexanol or uh, the two propanol, right? And before before you name them, though, it's usually so there's our cyclohexanol. And it, because it's an isopropyl group, it seems it's tempting to call it a methyl, ethyl, methyl ethanol. Um, but when you draw it out, it's a propyl with, with 
the oxygen on the second, so just two propanol or isopropyl alcohol. That's rubbing alcohol, right? So those are the two molecules we could start from. Both cases, the first step is going to be NaH, right? For the top reaction, what are we going to have as our second? So a propyl group, right, with um, a halogen, whichever halogen is convenient, either bromide or iodide or chloride for that matter, um, depending on what we have in the stock room, right? Iodide would be two iodo propane or two bromo propane. And on the bottom, it would be bromo cyclohexane, right? Again, a lot of times we just pick whether it's iodo versus bromo just to make sure it's at least a liquid at room temperature because we really don't want to be dealing with any, you know, because bromo methane is a gas at room temperature. We definitely don't want to be having to deal with any gaseous byproduct or um, reactants. Um, but really, as long as it's at least a liquid at room temperature, either bromo or iodo would work for either of these. Liquid, you've noticed that in OCAM, we work with liquid reactants a lot because they're easy to measure out. Uh, but gap, but solid reactants work just as well. Um, you just have to go to the trouble to dissolve them first. If you have a liquid reactant, then you don't need a solvent. Uh, that doesn't really particularly matter one way or the other. Is one of these a better option or are they both gonna be roughly the same? Yeah, they both have a secondary alcohol being deprotonated and acting on a secondary carbon, right? Um, if one of them was primary, then we would want to make sure that, that the primary carbon was the target in step two. Um, if one of them was tertiary, then we can't use that one as the target in step two. But either way, in this case, this would be this would be a case just like with a lot of the green yard reagents uh, where we would just be like, okay, well, what do we have in the stock room? I know we have isopropyl alcohol in the stock room. We have bromocyclohexane in the stock room. Maybe, maybe not. Probably the, if I had to guess, just based on what I think, I know we have cyclohexanol as well. We have both of the, these alcohols in the stock room in our stock, stock room right now. We might have bromopropane or iodopropane. I would guess that the second option might be a little more likely for us to have at our tiny stock room here. We'll be able to see in a couple weeks when we move because Mario is going to be hard at work during spring break, um, getting all the chemicals moved. As it turns out that's actually a non-trivial process. Moving is always a headache, right? But when you're moving hazardous chemicals, um, then it's even more of a headache. So she'll be able to let us know which of those we have. if we actually cared to double check our answers on this. All right, so those Williamson ether synthesis, they have steric considerations thing to worry about, but at the same time, it's pretty straightforward. So you're gonna start with an alcohol and a corresponding alkyl halide. Yes. Yeah, the, tar the sterics of the target are matter a lot more than the sterics. They both matter, but it's the target matters more because you can still have a tertiary alcohol act as a nucleophile, even if it's not great at it. Um, you effectively can't have it act as the target. Uh, 
Um, we can get ethers to react backwards as well. This is basically the reverse of the first reaction that we started with, right? There was acid catalyzed ether formation. You can also do acid catalyzed um, ether cleavage, where you basically just chop it up. Basically, but the first step, well, what is one positive? I'm telling you that it's basically undoing that first mechanism. Try drawing a mechanism here. See if you can work out a, something that seems plausible. So acidic conditions, so first thought should be going to involve proton transfer, right? If you've got a strong acid, the only target really on an ether that you could protonate is one of those oxygen lone pairs. And so first step, still have everything attached. Needed a protonated ether. So, what's the next step going to be? Yeah, we have the half. If we have a halogen around, it's a nucleophile, right? Where is it going to attack? The oxygen has a plus charge but does that mean that it actually would still be a, would it still be a target for a nucleophile yeah because the yes the oxygen has a formal charge of plus one but it's still oxygen it still has a lot of electron density and i don't know that we could say that it has a partial negative but it's still got a lot of electron density around it as opposed to the carbons that are attached to the oxygen those are still part of a polar bond, right? The part of the polar bond that has the partial positive is the carbon. But in order to attack that carbon, so and effectively, Yes, we gave the oxygen a positive charge, but don't think of that as giving the oxygen a positive charge. Think of protonating, when you protonate an oxygen, really what you're doing is you're making it a better leaving group. It's no longer a good nucleophile, it's a good leaving group. Because now what do we get? We're gonna get a red R group, an alcohol attached to it, 
our blue R group with chloride attached. In general, when you're trying to write a mechanism, especially doing one blind like this, look at the product of what you're gonna make and look if it seems familiar. Trying to make a new bond between a chlorine and an oxygen, that's not something we've really seen before, right? So that should be a red flag. If you can try to make a functional group that's something we've never seen before, that's a hint that maybe you picked the wrong target. Easy to do. Like I said, I think I, I used myself as an example. My worst chemistry test score ever was when I thought I had mechanisms figured out and could do them on the fly. Um, and I tried to do, to write my own mechanism on a test um, with totally blind. Like, I don't need to memorize mechanisms. I'll just figure it out as I go. It's just, we just follow the negatives around. What's, how hard could that be? Um, it's pretty hard, turns out, until you really get the hang of it. So that gave us part of our product, right? What are we going to do to get the other chloride? We still have acid around, don't we? It's concentrated strong acid. Yeah. It's just instead of ether being attacked. are being pronated, you're going to pronate the alcohol instead. We still have our chloride, another chloride floating around, right? The last step is do the exact same thing one more time. Chloride comes in, attacks SN2 style to the R group. Water leaves. You get another alkyl halide and another water molecule. Not another water molecule. We didn't have a water molecule the first time. That result is you took both of the oxygen carbon bonds and turned them into oxygen hydrogen bonds to make water molecule. And you replace the carbon oxygen bonds with a carbon halogen bond. So the, and this is really just an equilibrium and using Le Chatelier's and using concentrations and entropy to sort of favor one direction or the other. You can't really um, get this reaction to go backwards that easily, but we can turn alkyl halide back into an alcohol, right? And if we turn one of those alkyl halides into an alcohol and leave the others an alkyl halide, then we can basically do Williamson ether synthesis going the other way to get back to the ether. So this, but this is basically just chopping the ether apart. Um, why is the heat necessary in this case? The other one. High, high heat favors high entropy, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And so rather than have, exactly, rather than have um, one big molecule, it make, it's more entropic, it's more disordered to have three small molecules. And so here's the neater version of that same one. Protonate the ether, halide acts as a nucleophile. The alcohol that's left, you protonate the alcohol, halide acts as a nucleophile. Same thing I just drew, just more clear. So let's just do some practice with these. Last two slides are just practice with either reactions that we've done so far.
it's all acidic cleavage, right? It's just a matter of chop it up and see what you get. If you can chop it up completely, a uh, given, especially when aromatics are involved. Over two, because it's a symmetric ether, we're going to get the same alcohol twice. But other than that, and I ran the two into the molecule a little bit. So it's going to be a methyl, two methyl, one bromo propane. You get two molecules of that plus water. Cyclic ethers look a little bit different, but this it's still a symmetric ether. You're just going to wind up um, with the same thing happening to the same molecule. And so you're still going to block or break up those two spots and replace them with with iodines in this case. And when you're doing with the, these cyclic ones, we have the same thing happening twice in the same molecule. A lot of times it's helpful to draw them, the carbons in the same spot physically. Even if it makes it look a little bit cramped, we broke both of the carbon oxygen bonds and replaced it with carbon iodine bonds, right? Once you have that drawn, you can redraw it in a way that looks more, more normal. So this is four carbon. So one, two, three, four, iodine, iodine. Now, when we see a benzene ring, though, we should be concerned, right? We're not going to just chop this one up wholesale because benzene rings aren't good targets for SN2 reactions. Since replacing the oxygen bond with a halogen bond was an SN2 reaction, basically not going to be able to break a benzene oxygen bond. So we'll chop it up there. So we're going to get phenol and ethyl bromide. Actually, no water in this case. So what do we get with D? We have it all as one molecule now. Everything's attached to the benzene ring. Can we do this reaction at all? Can't break benzene to carbon to oxygen bond directly, but that other side of the ring, that can still be broken up. Okay, so you're still going to wind up with something that looks kind of like a phenol. It is a phenol. 
just a substituted null. Now on the other side, be careful you count your carbons. Well, because it's easy to mess these up. So three carbons. And then your iodide. So one, two, three, then iodide. Something about breaking up these rings and unfolding them makes it really easy to lose track of how many carbons you have. Uh, so just be careful with those. Yeah, yeah, because it looks like you're adding another carbon because it takes, it looks like it's taking the spot of a carbon. No aromatics on E, so we are, even though it's a cyclic structure, we are still going to be able to chop it up twice. And it's just a matter of making sure to redraw everything in the same position so you don't lose any carbons. It looks like a a um, crowded molecule when it's drawn that way, but that's that's my strategy when you're breaking the ring structure up to make sure that you don't lose anything is to redraw everything in the same position first, and then unfold it the rest of the way. Make sure you get the same number of carbons. Two, three, four, two, three. That's going to be an octane. One, one, five diiodo, five methyl octane. Probably count from the other side of the molecule. Um, and then it's going to have some stereochemistry associated with it as well. But if I counted correctly, our longest continuous carbon chain. like that. And by comparison, F is really simple, right? F, we're just going to get the bromocyclohexane and bromoethane. And water, yeah. The only ones where you don't get water as a byproduct are going to be the two um, aromatic ones because you can't chop off the oxygen entirely if you can't break the carb, the benzene oxygen bond. So C and D won't have water as a byproduct. You just have a leftover alcohol still. The phenol group is still out, is still there. But for all of the rest of them, the oxygens are gone, replaced with water and halogens. Or the oxygens gone, turned into water, it's replaced by the halogen. Last up is some is some review of a bunch of these reactions we've gone through. But based on the time, we'll start with this on Thursday. Um, so do this as a little bit of review before class on Thursday, and then we'll go through the answers um, to make sure everybody remembers everything. Remember. 
try and turn it into, chunk it up into different reaction classes. Like there's ozonolysis, followed by excess lithium aluminum hydride. So ozonolysis followed by reduction. Next one is, or C is a Grignard reagent, a Grignard reaction followed by oxidation, followed by another Grignard reagent. Right, so it's a five steps, but it's three reactions, really, is because most of those reactions have more than one step to them. All right, so break it up, see what you can recognize, in turn, and then um, what type of reaction is it? Is it oxidation? Is it reduction? All right. Um, let's go ahead and stop there. Any questions on today's stuff? I guess we have an extra minute. Right now, we digest for now. You can always ask questions in lab if you have them.